Welcome to Wine for Normal People, the podcast for people who like wine, but not the snobbery that goes with it. I'm your host, Elizabeth Schneider, author of the Wine for Normal People book and certified wine dork. And I'm MC Ice, just a wine-loving normal person. This show is sponsored by Wine Access. Go to wineaccess.com slash normal. Join my wine club to get amazing wines, $150 for six bottles, four shipments a year. I hand select all of them. You have got to get on it today. Wineaccess.com slash normal. Now let's get to the show. I'm excited for today's show. I'm not going to lie. I can't believe we've never covered this part of Bordeaux because this is my secret. It is? Yes. I'll take, but I'll take any part of Bordeaux. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Anytime that I teach the wines of Bordeaux class, this is the wine that people are blown away by. And it's one of the ones that they stick with over and over again. So and that le- is the Cote de Bordeaux. So left bank, right bank. What, there's a middle bank that I don't know about? <laughs> no, it's a very complex topic. So I really need to get into it to explain what this is, because it's not a set appellation. It is a group of appellations that share some common characteristics, but more than that, they needed something. And so they it's decided like a consortium? to... consortium? It's sort of like a consortium, but... It's a little different. Let me explain it. Let's do patron shout outs. We don't have many. I always want to be grateful and thankful for patrons. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash wine for normal people. To everyone who's joined, you are reaping the benefits of it. Hopefully, hopefully you're loving it. Lots of new members and we appreciate it. This week, we just have a real short list. We've got Tesh, Carlos, Thomas H., Luis C., Calum C., and Kimber J. Thank you all so, so much. You guys make this podcast go. And without you, we couldn't do it. And I guess I'll announce now that within the next couple of weeks, the entire back catalog of Wine for Normal People, except the last year's show, Mm -hmm. will be behind Patreon. So if you want to access old episodes of Wine for Normal People going forward, you'll have to become a Patreon member. Or there will be a subscription service. So, so oh. yeah, so we're going to be doing that. And lots of other really cool stuff is coming down the pipe for Patreon, including some local, if you're in the Raleigh area and you're a patron, there's going to be some cool stuff. DC also, we have some things coming up. So Great. anyway, 2024, we're moving Patreon to the next levels. Also, lots of people are trying to sign up for the Wines of Greece class. I understand it's sold and oversold. If I get... 30 people on the wait list, though, mm-hmm. I will run it again. But I need like to make sure I will run it again in the next couple of weeks. Oh, but wow. I need to make sure that I have that many people to run it. So I'm, you know, if you're interested in taking it, and you can't get in. You got to sign up for the wait list. That's all I'm going to say. Wineformnormalpeople.com slash classes. And I will be launching a bunch of new ones, including one for Europe and the UK time zone. So please make sure if you're in Europe and you want to take a class that you get on that, it will be a daytime US class and an evening UK EU class. Wait, if you do have two Greece classes, does that mean you will have to recork the bottles after the first class? Actually, I have a whole bunch of Greek wine, so okay. I'm only going to have to acquire a couple okay. new bottles. But I've already said, as I said in the other podcast, I'll just hop over to Chapel Hill to that great shop True. and get some. So okay, that's well, then you exciting. have my permission for a Thank second you. Thank class, you. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. If you're interested and you're frustrated that it's sold out, don't worry. I'm listening. I watch one person show here. It's not like anybody else is like right. the Empire is right. watching. It's not like I'm Darth Vader. Is that I bad? Mean, like, you or know. Like, yeah, and then no, I've got I mean, like those. I was gonna say most days. You're are not. you yeah. my stormtroopers? You're yeah, not really so affiliated li- with the Empire. Like, so who would you be? No, I think more like Boba Fett. That's my family nickname. You can't call. Him, you can't say you're Boba okay. Fett. I am actually Greedo? Boba Fett. By the end of the show, just I want to know bounty who you hunter. are. I just do. I'm just for hire. I do what you say. Let's move on and go to the most important thing, which is the Cote de Bordeaux. This is. Like I said, my secret way of getting very affordable and sometimes extremely reliable wines from Bordeaux that are better than Bordeaux Superior or just regular AOC Bordeaux. How? Let me just describe first what these are. These are wines that are generally not as age-worthy 
as the wines from the separate communes like Saint Emilion right. or Pomerol or Pogliac, Saint Julien. Still somewhat ageable. They can be somewhat age worthy. We are drinking a 2015 right now, and okay. it's 2024, Ooh, that was a good so nine year, years. Wasn't it? Very good year. Yep. These are very well made wines from historic vineyards, and when I say historic vineyards, these well predate the Medoc. Many parts of the Medoc were not even drained hmm. when they were already making wine in these places. The coat, coat means, and if you've listened to the Burgundy podcast, you know this, that coat means slope. So these, unlike most of Bordeaux, especially the Medoc, I shouldn't say the right thing, but mm-hmm. the Medoc is very flat. Hmm. When we're talking about Margot or Pogliac, you're generally not going to say that there's an orientation because it's on flat land. Here, I am going to be talking about orientation because we have hillsides. These are also not second wines. They're not bulk wines. They are generally family owned. They are often sustainable. Some of these places have incredible organic and biodynamic programs going on. They're always a great value for the money. This is a place with unique terroir but it's also affordable. So you have young and scrappy winemakers. You have a lot of women winemakers here. You have some foreign investment. The combined Cote de Bordeaux, and I'm saying combined because these are five diverse areas that I'm going to cover. Three are very close to one another and two are farther away. And and it's, it again, you have to think of this more as a marketing thing. The combined acreage is 25,900 acres But remember that Bordeaux is about 270,000 acres or 10,481 hectares. And again, Bordeaux is about 101,000 hectares. This is 9 or 10 percent of production. 10 percent of production. That's it. I don't want you to be thinking of these wines as a second wine. This is another type of Bordeaux. So there's not a lot of it. It's delicious. So why is it so cheap? There's a lot of competition. So we are talking about 989 small producer growers Within the family of 6,460 Chateau. So this is just a small sliver. 97% of what is made in Cote de Bordeaux is red. However, I am going to make this caveat in case you have to pause this and you don't ever listen to it again. That 3% of white is awesome. Okay. Do not write off the blanc of the Cote de Bordeaux. But this is mainly red, and mainly Merlot. So this is one of the similarities of the five Cote de Bordeaux. Mainly Merlot with Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, and Malbec. So there is actually a significant amount of Malbec grown in these areas. The whites are mainly Sauvignon Blanc, although some of these places have a huge proportion of Semillon with some Muscadel. So if Cote de Bordeaux is Merlot, based, Merlot-driven. Does that mean it's made in sort of the right bank style? There are three areas that are on the right bank and two that are in a different area. Okay. So yes and no. All right. Let me go over the history because it really does give this place a little bit more credibility. Okay. Second century, the Romans established the first plans for Vitis Baturica here. According to Asonius in the fourth century, wine was already known for quality in Rome from these areas. I want to be really clear, from Hmm. these areas. So Bordeaux really took off when Eleanor of Aquitaine married Henry Plantagenet. They got married. London became open to the wine of the coat. This was in 1152. And they used the rivers and access to the ocean to get the wines to England and then also to Holland. The wines of the coat were seen as luxury wines by Bordeaux aristocrats also before the Madoc even became a thing. So these wines had status before the high status wines of today. They faltered a little bit when the English reign came to an end, as did all of the wines of Bordeaux. In 1453, actually, the Battle of Castillon, hint, hint, one of the coat is Castillon Cote de Bordeaux. Charles VII retook Bordeaux as part of France. It was the last battle of the Hundred Years' War between Britain and France, and it really started the rise of France as a nation. And this happened in Castillon, which is one of the coat. But it was popular again in the 1600s because as the colonies took off, these wines had some acidity and they had some tannin so they could survive the transport. Right. So they were favored by the English. In the 1700s, you also see a development of the red and the white in the coat. Again, when I'm talking about this history, this is not all Bordeaux. I'm not rehashing Bordeaux history. This is just for the coat. Mm -hmm. We fast forward 285 years. We get to 1985. The Cote de Bordeaux made 
the Cote de Bordeaux Association. Now, at that time, it was not all of these areas that I'm going to talk about, but it was a loose marketing association. But in 2004, and finalized in 2007, the Union de Cote de Bordeaux brought under the marketing banner a collective brand, the AOC Cote de Bordeaux. And under this, there were six appellations. One was the Cote de Bordeaux, which means that if you're in any of these appellations and you combine grapes with the other, Mm -hmm. or you just want to call it Cote de Bordeaux, great, you can do that. You're under that umbrella and you're covered. So these are the towns or the places. Bly Cote de Bordeaux, Castillon Cote de Bordeaux, Franc Cote de Bordeaux, which we're drinking right now, Cadillac or Cadillac, Cadillac Cote de Bordeaux, and Saint Foy Cote de Bordeaux. Those are the five, and you will see them on the bottle. It is very clear what is on the bottle. Now, the marketing consortium says they have to use the graphic or the name. Since 2009, you put the place name in front of the words Cote de Bordeaux, and you can mention the terroir of Bly, Castillon, Franc, Cadillac, or Saint Foy. Not that didn't come along till 2016. As they were being faced with increasingly strong competition, people do not know them as well as the right bank places of Pomerol and Saint-Emilion, the areas around Saint-Emilion, Fronsac, Canon Fronsac, and then all of the areas of the Médoc, saint mm-hmm. julien Margot, and Poliac saint Estephe and others. This was a way to get organized and to try to fight for some piece of the market. It was a great idea because people like me noticed and started buying these wines, and so did others of you. They also did something very clever. They decided that they were going to offer Masson de Vin, which is like these wine houses where you can have events with the food and tasting and discovery of the region. They're basically like visitor centers yeah. and they have tasting routes and things like that that you can organize throughout. So they really welcome visitors, unlike other places in Bordeaux. So in 2009, the AOC of the Côte de Bordeaux went into effect. This is the full organization. They had new branding in 2015. In 2016, Saint Foy officially joined the Union de Côte de Bordeaux, and now they're working to differentiate each of their own regions while staying as a marketing consortium. So, where is it? It's really confusing, and you're definitely going to need the map. Important to look at, but the AOCs in this marketing consortium are spread out. They are in the north, the east, the south of the city of Bordeaux. They are dominated by the rivers. You have a bunch that are on the right bank of the Gironde, which is also near Pomerol and Saint-Emilion. You have things that are on the right bank of the Dordogne. You have things that are on banks of the Garonne. And they are influenced by their proximity to the Atlantic Ocean, although some have a more continental climate and some have a more maritime climate. And as I said, they're named for the hill or the slope because they go up to a big whopping 416 feet or Mm -hmm. 127 meters. And that's pretty high for the greater Bordeaux area. What that means is that they have higher acidity. Also, the terroir is very similar, especially the soil type. So we already talked about slope. That's one aspect of terroir. They are generally maritime climates, again, some continental, with southern or southeastern-facing exposures, totally different from flatlands elsewhere. And they, because they are on rivers, closer to the river have gravel and sand. Then you move up the slope, you're getting more clay. Mm -hmm. And then limestone The subsoil, a lot of times, is limestone. Some of the defining characteristics of these wines are higher acidity than what you're going to find in other parts of Bordeaux, which can make these wines really delightful and make them really food-friendly, and in hot vintages, make them awesome because they're retaining their acidity. And in cool vintages, they can sometimes be too acidic. Mm -hmm. Again, not a problem that we see a lot of times these days in Bordeaux, but that's still going on. Most of these areas have lots of sunshine and less rain. They're drier than some of the things closer to the Atlantic in the west of Bordeaux. And as I said before, there's a big sustainability focus, especially on the right bank. This is a benefit of the consortium Mm -hmm. to transition to more environmentally friendly practices. So they're doing workshops on how to prune for climate change. In other words, you're going to prune less with climate change because you need shading for the grapes, yield control to make better wine, fewer chemical treatments, 
80% of the producers are doing some kind of sustainable farming or hmm. conversion. It just takes time. Producers are... They it's have not going to be labeled as such, though, right? No, it won't be. Some of them will have the HVE symbol, the high mm-hmm. high value environmental symbol, or they'll have teravitis on them. There's various different certifications for sustainability that actually do have teeth in this area. Lots of young producers, people are definitely on the move. They're interested in change. So I said that they're all Merlot dominant. I'm going to go over some of the individual differences between these. But what I do want to say is since Merlot is dominant and we are in Bordeaux and the soil types are similar, you are going to have some variation. But generally speaking, the wines tend to have red fruit, like cherry, plum notes, If they're oak-aged, and not all of them are, you'll have some mocha and leather because that's the flavors that come with an oak-aged Merlot oftentimes. The whites, peachy, citrus, like grapefruit if there's a lot of Sauvignon Blanc, pineapple sometimes with Sauvignon Blanc, softer and rounder if it's semillon, a little grassy. The whites tend to be lovely still with great acidity because, again, that limestone is there. In general, these wines are round. They are not going to bring a lot of tannin because Merlot does not have high tannin. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be very elegant, meaning they have acidity. So they're not going to be heavy or weigh you down. And the the dry whites are going to be really fine. They're very, very underestimated, especially the whites. I'm sure the alcohol levels are kept in check also, right? Not always. Depends. Because of the higher acidity, Mm -hmm. the warmer vintages are actually going to be tastier. You might get higher alcohol levels, but the difference here is that you're never going to have high tannins, so you can drink them pretty much right away, and you've got acidity that will always balance out the higher alcohol. Hmm. Pretty good, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, we already talked about the Cote de Bordeaux as the umbrella appellation. You could see on the bottle Cote de Bordeaux, and you'll know that it doesn't have an individual terroir, but generally the wines are going to be friendly and very fruit-forward and Merlot-based. And then we have the more serious Cote de Bordeaux. I am going to start out with the top two, and then we will talk about the other ones. There are two that are looked on and priced in some cases as if they are the superior two of the Cote de Bordeaux. And the first one is Castillon Cote de Bordeaux. Now, this is on the right bank. The following three that I'm going to talk about are on the right bank, meaning they're on the Merlot side, they are near saint emilion and they share some similar characteristics. So Castillon... That looks pretty small. How big is it? They are not very big. So this is 45 kilometers or 28 miles east of Bordeaux. It is on the right bank of the Dordogne. So that means it is not directly across from the Madoc. It is inland, similar to where saint emilion is. It's bordered by saint emilion in the west, and it has the Dordogne River in the southern reaches of its Appalachian. Right. Because it is so close to saint emilion it shares the same limestone plateau that made saint emilion so famous. And until... It got its own AOC in 1935. Castillon wines were called Pre Saint Emilione, which means near Saint Emilion. And it was kind of like, you know, those vineyards over there that are similar. Seems like it's a coattail rider. (sighs) All right. This is the third largest of the coat. You're looking at the map and saying how small it is. It's the third largest. It is 5,683 acres or mm-hmm. 2,300 hectares spread out over nine villages or communes. The average estate is about 10 hectares or 25 acres. So small. 230 growers, three co-ops, 25% of the vignerons here practice organic or biodynamic farming. Really good. Hmm. That's really, really great for Bordeaux. There is a lot of wine that comes out of Castillon. 13 million bottles a year on average, or 1 million cases. Wow. And there's a lot of overseas investors here, because think about this. This is basically an extension of the saint emilion terroir. British, American, Dutch, Hmm. Irish, Spanish, Belgian, lots of potential here, and people are seeing that. And there's also some investment from big names in Bordeaux. The Castillon wines are the most expensive of the Cote, along with Franc, which we'll talk about next. Which borders just to the north, right? That's right. It's very, very close, basically attached. There's a 100-meter altitude difference, or 330 feet, really not that high, meaning that there's 
variance in climate, though, because as you go up the slope, you're going to have a slightly different climate than what you'll have at the bottom near the river. Since it's on the north side of the Dordogne, are they southern facing slopes then? The slopes are south facing okay. when there are slopes. With the southern exposure, does that mean that they get riper or... It depends on where you are on the slope. There are alluvial and gravel soils near the Dordogne. If you have that, you're going to have more warmth because gravel soils warm up. You'll have more ripeness. Cabernet Sauvignon will do better there. As you move farther away from the river on the foothills, you'll have some sand, gravel, and clay As you get into those clay soils, you'll have more Merlot there, gravel again, great for Cabernet Sauvignon. And then you will have a mixture of what you'll grow. But in general, if you have some slope on the foothills, you'll get a little bit more heat. There are clay limestone and marl soils on the higher hillsides to the plateau, and those are warmer. So the south-facing slopes definitely are going to pick up more heat, but it depends on the soil type as well. That's all going to matter. It all comes into play. And there's a lot of microclimates too. Hmm. Closer to the river, more humidity, more oceanic. As you get higher, you're going to get more continental and it's going to be more extreme heat, warmer, fewer cooling breezes from the ocean, and it will get colder during the wintertime. In general, Castellana is going to do well in hot vintages, as I said, because that natural acidity is going to contrast to very ripe fruit and it's going to create something very beautiful. Hmm. This is a red Appalachian only. Do not look for whites from Castellana. It is red only. 70% of the plantings in Castellana are Merlot. Wow. 20% Cabernet Franc, 10% Cabernet Sauvignon. Does that translate into similar ratios in the final wine production? No. It all depends on the vintage and it depends on the individual producer. But overall, there will be a very high percentage of Merlot in these wines, and they are notably quite similar to the wines of Saint-Emilion. Sometimes they're way better. Because they have to be. That's the thing about the Cote de Bordeaux. People don't know them. So they have to be a little bit better than what you would expect. And they cost a little bit less. So they are round. They're fruit driven. They have soft tannins and silkiness from the Merlot, similar to many Saint-Emilion's, not all. They're fruity. They have mineral notes. They're sometimes a little spicy, sometimes your favorite. They can be like licorice, going back to our oh, poll question. Neat, neat, I know, no. lots of people, some people did, agreed with you and did not like licorice. We asked oh, in a did. Patreon poll, what are the characteristics you like least in wine? And MCIs hates anise or licorice, and some people agreed with them. Anyway, uh, they can be juicy. You have some smart listeners. That's good. Oh, that's so <laughs> insulting. I love licorice. <laughs> they can be juicy, they can be dense, but the common thing is that they are almost always Merlot lead, and they have a lot of acidity. Great wines. You will look for Castillon Cote de Bordeaux. The Chateau you can look for, and these are available. I'm only giving you things that are widely available. I'll put in the show notes. Cap de Fauge, Puy Arnaud, Chateau de Guy, and Lettre. Can you remind the listeners or where they the can send the department? Yes, where they can send the hate mail for the uh, pronunciation, the send, French pronunciations. You can send it. In, there is a, a file on your computer mm-hmm. that you can send it from. It's called the circular oh, file. Yep, it's yes. probably down in the lower. Lower, yep. That's uh-huh. exactly where you can put okay, it. Good. Yes. So that is Castillon, most expensive, most Saint-Emilion like Franc Cote de Bordeaux. Designated as an AOC in 1967, way after Castillon, 50 kilometers or 30 miles northeast of Bordeaux, about 15 miles or 10 kilometers east of Saint-Emilion. Quite close to Saint-Emilion once again, not touching like Castillon, but close. The heart of the AOC is actually not Franc, which is a town, but San Cibar. Vineyards are interspersed with trees and they're on rolling hills. So the eastern border is actually the end of the Department of the Gironde. Mm -hmm. This is the last gasp of Bordeaux before you get into other parts. So this is no longer Bordeaux after you hit the eastern flank of Franc-Côte de Bordeaux. This is the second smallest and the most eastern of the Côte, and it is very diverse. It's only 1,075 acres or 435 hectares, over three communes. The average estate is 10 hectares or 25 acres. There are only 41 growers. 
That's it? Two co-ops. Yes. North of Castellon is where you'll find Franck, close to saint Emilion, so it's going to have those fossil-rich limestone soils that both Castellon and saint Emilion have. Is it farther up the slopes then? Yes, it's some of the highest altitudes of the five Appalachians, clocking in at an enormous towering 110 meters or 361 oh, feet. Oh, Lord, it's probably tough to breathe up there. I don't I think it's it's got to be. Yeah. I don't know. Compared to these alpine wines, the stuff in Switzerland, mm-hmm. Trentino, mm-hmm. Alto Adige, it's got to be tough. I'm kidding. 50%, five zero, not 15, five zero percent of the Appalachian is organic or biodynamic. What? This is the greenest Appalachian in Bordeaux. They have made an enormous effort The climate is different here because we are inland. We're relatively northern. Now we have a dry continental climate. More continental, right. Right. Cold in the winter, hotter in the summertime. Because of the way that the airflow patterns are, they really don't get a lot of rain, but they get a ton of sun. It can be between 3 and 5 degrees Fahrenheit, 2 to 3 degrees Celsius warmer in the summer and that same amount cooler in the winter. And that's going to make a difference with the vines and the development, especially in the spring and in the fall. The limestone soils here will balance the heat in the warmer years, though. And also you have a little bit higher altitude, so it's a little cooler than Castillon. So you will get acidity. I hope that we are convincing you of how absolutely spectacular these wines from the Cote de Bordeaux are. And if you want to get wines from the Cote de Bordeaux and other outstanding wines from all over the world, I recommend that you go to Wine Access. WineAccess.com slash normal is how you'll join my wine club with Wine Access. We spend so much time selecting wines, sourcing wines, finding the right combination of things that I know you're going to love. I do all of the tasting notes. I do the selection with the Wine Access team, the videos, everything. And if you're a patron, you also get a live tasting of these wines. Please check it out today. It is the best value. It's like hitting the easy button and going to Wine Access in general and you can get there and get 10% off your first order by going to wineaccess.com slash normal. It'll pop up a page of the wines that I am loving right now, but it'll get you into the site, get you 10% off, and you'll be able to see a store of wines, a standing collection, plus things that change all the time. These are wines that are fully vetted by people with excellent taste. So it's like walking into a wine shop where everything is delicious. How often can you really say that? Shipping is free on orders over 150 bucks. They have a never settle guarantee. You don't like the bottle? They'll give you a credit for another one. Go to wineaccess.com slash normal and join the wine club or wineaccess.com slash WFMP. Get 10% off your first order. That first shipment is coming out soon. You don't want to miss it. Also, don't forget wine classes, wineforNormalPeople.com slash classes. Make 2024 the year that you hang out with me and a group of awesome people and learn about tasting wine and really get into very dorky details with me. You can ask questions. The classes are live and online, so you can take them from anywhere. WineForNormalPeople.com slash classes. And don't forget Patreon, uh, the community that keeps this podcast going. P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash WineForNormalPeople. Now let's get back to the show. These slopes are actually eastern facing. So you get lots of morning sun and get less of that hot western sun in the afternoon. Would that kind of continental climate? Do they have to worry about the violent thunderstorms during the summer and spring months? A lot of Bordeaux does have to worry about that. But much like Alsace and much like Burgundy, there is some protection when you're east facing from the stuff that's coming from the west. Low rainfall, protection from the storms and hail that's going to happen in the valleys of the Dordogne. They're not getting that here. The limestone clay soils, subsoils of that fossil-rich limestone. It's also covered with something called limestone molasses. It's not molasses. Not molasses. It's not no, it's not sugar. It's a combination of broken up continental and marine sedimentary rock. Hmm, okay. Then there's some shale and sandstone. Lots of great soil types for diverse flavors and things that are interesting. And again, those cooler soils, a little bit later ripening with the acidic wines. They are amazing in warmer years. 
So with given that these regions are so small and that there's that kind of diversity in the soil types, is this a, a situation where one row can differ from another? Are we getting down to that kind of granularity? It's in swaths. This is only one of two Côte de Bordeaux appellations that makes red, dry white, and sweet wines made from botrytized grapes. So you will see Franc Côte de Bordeaux in Blanc, and you should buy it. Is it good? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, it is. They make about 100,000 bottles out of the Appalachian or 8,300 cases. Mm -hmm. Sweet wine is even smaller, apparently great, but it is shrinking. It's becoming more and more rare. 2,000 bottles of sweet wine. But the breakdown of white is 60% semillon, 8% muscadel, 32% Sauvignon Blanc. Some people will make 100% Sauvignon Blanc, but a lot of people use a high proportion of semillon. Hmm. So those are going to be like some of the high quality wines made elsewhere in Bordeaux. And that's pretty awesome. They are going to be labeled Franc Cote de Bordeaux and they will be white. So check what it's made with. I prefer the ones that have some blend and aren't 100% Sauvignon, but it is what it is. On the reds, this is their biggest production, 233,000 cases plus 2.8 million bottles. So even for one of the smallest Appalachians, there's a lot of wine being produced here. 60% Merlot, again, different breakdown from Castillon, which is 70% Merlot. And here we have 25% Cabernet Sauvignon, a little bit more heat. Cabernet needs heat to ripen. 15% Cabernet Franc. Some people are experimenting with more Malbec. And there is going to be more... Cabernet Sauvignon influence in this wine, in the Franc, than there will be in Castillon. Again, another differentiation. It's going to be fruity, but it won't be as aromatic as Castillon. Castillon is highly aromatic. You get a ton of fruit and flowers and minerals. Franc is a little bit more reserved. It's more tannic. It might be able to age a little better as we're seeing in our wine, which is a 2015, which also has some minerality and some violets. Our wine is a very famous wine in Chateau Puigero. It is owned by the Thiempon family, which is the biggest influence here. They also are big in saint Emilion. You have Chateau de Franc which is actually owned by the same people who own the Grand Cru Classé Chateau Angelou, which is one of the most famous saint emilion mm -hmm. puy en Le Puy. So those are from Franck, and they are amazing. And the one that we are having is Chateau puy and it is tasty as anything. Do you want it to is, describe it, MCI? I cannot do it justice. I'm more of a texture person, and it is like drinking velvet. I get some of those mocha notes. I get a little... I get a little Prunish. I'm not getting any of those green pepper notes. So this wine is 80% Merlot, 15% Cab Franc, and 5% Malbec, and 100% Silky Deliciousness. It, that is a very apt description. Can I ask another question, though? Yes. You keep mentioning Malbec. Why is there this newfound interest? Is it newfound, and why do you see them experimenting more with Malbec in, this, in the region? Malbec is a fantastic grape. And Argentina has proved that, as has Cahors farther south yep. in southwest France. Malbec has been hanging around in Bordeaux for right. a long time. Carmenere was the one that really suffered after the frost of 1956. Malbec was still around in smaller proportions. I do think, although I have no evidence of this, that with the emphasis in Argentina of Malbec and the fact that people really like it, producers are more, they're feeling better about including it, but it's always been included in the blends here to soften and round because things out. Because they feel and give like the market's more familiar with it and, can, and willing to accept it now? No, I think that it is a great grape when grown correctly, hmm. and it is something where you can get a lot of plush, juicy flavors. If your Merlot is growing on a cooler site and is a bit more tannic. Malbec can add plushness and lushness. Cab Franc is going to add some tea-like notes. It's going to add some earthy notes. It can add the green pepper and it can add some tannin to Merlot. But I think that Malbec does a nice job of making everything more plush and lush and a little mm -hmm. bit friendlier, frankly. And there's nothing bad about that at all. Although, again, Merlot also tends to be very plush and lush. Just different flavors. Merlot is red fruit and... Malbec is black fruit. So if you want a combination of the two and you want things to even out, but you still want that plushness and you don't want Cabernet Sauvignon coming in and adding too much tannin mm -hmm. or throwing green pepper notes, Malbec doesn't have those problems. So it's kind of a nice blender. 
The next one is Bly Cote de Bordeaux. This is the final one that we'll be covering on the right bank. Now, it started out actually in 1936 as the AOC Bly. It was a red wine appellation, and it has had a lot of different names. Bly is a little confusing. Uh, you mean Blay? B-L-A-Y-E. It was then the Premier Cote de Bly, and then it was just the Cote de Bly, and now it's Bly Cote de Bordeaux. So older bottles, which you shouldn't be keeping around because these don't age very well, and they're really for immediate consumption, are going to say Premier Cote de Bly or just Cote de Bly. But today, what you will look for is the standard thing, which I will post in the show notes for everybody and, of course, in Patreon, Bly Cote de Bordeaux. The AOC Cote de Bordeaux is for red and dry white. And this is on the Gironde facing the Medoc. So whereas before with Castillon and Franc, we are closer to saint Emilion, we are inland, we have continental climates. This is facing the Medoc. This is 28 miles or 45 kilometers north of Bordeaux. And this is the largest of the Cote far and away. It's like across from Margot, right? It's not too far away from Margot, Bordeaux, the the city. 430 wine growers. Remember, I said 41 in Franc. 430 here, 10 times the amount. Three co-ops. But there are lots of family farms here. Does that mean, given that it's that much bigger, is it harder to find the the real standouts? I think that is one of the big problems. The one thing that I will say is, though, that Bly, most producers sell direct. Two-thirds of them sell to private customers, to wine merchants Hmm. and restaurants. And only one third is sold to trade in large French retailers or for export. Only 15% of Bly is exported. 16,062 acres or 6,500 hectares across 41 communes. The average estate is 42 acres or 17 hectares. These are way bigger because before I was talking about 10 or 11 hectares. Now we're talking about 17 hectares or 42 acres versus 25 acres. 28% organic or biodynamic with 13% in conversion. And there's a lot of that high value environmental certification for biodiversity and management of fertilization. They're doing pretty well, especially for such a large area. You definitely have to give it to the producers of Blythe. They've already exceeded Castillon, but they're definitely nipping on the heels of Franck. So good for them. The terroir is super varied. To the north, you've got sand and clay and gravel soils. So Sauvignon Blanc is going to be really, really good there and get really great aromas on the sand. In the west, which is near the estuary, the Gironde estuary, it's a river, but it's an estuary going out to the ocean, southwest and west-facing slopes. This is different wine from stuff that's facing east in the Franc. You have less clay and more sand. So that's going to create lighter wines, but the south and west-facing slopes are going to create very ripe wines. In the east of the Appalachian, now we go back to what we were talking about before, clay, limestone, gravel, and sand. But the problem is sometimes they're not well-drained. So they can be good for aromatic Merlot on good sites, but there are also poor quality sites that are in Bly. It is a bit more of a risk. There is definitely a maritime influence here. We are way closer to the Atlantic than we were with these first two Côte de Bordeaux. Lots of rain, lots of sun too. It's hilly. There is actual southern exposure. I said southwest and southeast, but mm-hmm. there's there's this warm southern exposure. But there is so much variation that producer is probably more important than vintage. The cheaper bottle price means that they can't get a lot of money. They can't invest because nobody's going to pay. So the wine is cheap and cheerful because nobody wants to pay for these wines. Are Cassian there any good and- values? There are some great values, but the problem is, you know, Castellano and Franck have really arrived. They're close to saint Emilion. They've been able to play off of that. Much harder for Bly because it's huge. So the couple of good producers really need to stand out. But in general, when you get a wine from Bly, it's going to be simple. It'll be aromatic. Great acidity if it's on limestone. We we have no way of knowing that when we pick up a bottle. 90% of production is red, Hmm. 70% Merlot. 20% 20% Cabernet Sauvignon, 10% Malbec. The rules actually say that Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon and Cabernet Franc have to be at least 50% of the blend, and Malbec and Petit Verdot no more than 15% of the blend. But barely any Cabernet Franc is grown here, so it doesn't 
make a lot of sense. And there's almost no Petit Verdot grown on the right bank at all. Hmm. 32 million bottles or 2.7 million cases of red. That seems like a uh, healthy percentage of the region. Look, if you love Merlot, Bly is going to provide that for you. But we like Merlot. Yes, Bly is delicious. Do you ever seek it out? Absolutely. Okay. The whites are also 10% of production. 2 million bottles of white or 167,000 cases. Mostly Sauvignon Blanc, tiny bit of Muscadel and Semillon. They can be excellent. Easy wines to find. Chateau Bonange. Chateau Bellevue, Chateau Gigot, and Pinard. These are good wines. These are four really solid producers that you can find very widely, very inexpensive, and they're tasty. We move over to the other places. Now, this is where it gets a little weird because we could make an argument that Bly and Castillon and Franck are all on the right bank, And they're similar. That's pretty easy. Yeah, that's a pretty good argument. They've got similar terroir. Yeah. And then we got some other stuff. So we are going to move. Where is this other stuff? The other stuff is technically it is on the border of the Entrée du Mer. It is not on the left bank and it is not on the right bank, but in the area between two rivers. However. Oh my God, I was right. The middle bank. It is the middle bank. (laughs) Okay. But they are considered separate from Entrée du Mer. They do not want to be associated with that because Entrée du Mer is generally associated with pretty low quality. And these are special areas that are different. The first one is Cadillac Côte de Bordeaux. This is a red-only appellation. And this is super confusing. And this actually took me a while to unwind. This area, Cadillac, Mm. used to be called the Premier Côte de Bordeaux, not Cadillac. Then they were... Bought by GM? No, but I am going to get to that. And today it's spelled it is like called, Cadillac. Well, I'm going to get to that. But now it is Cadillac Côte de Bordeaux. The Romans were already planting here. Ausonius mentioned it in the area of maybe 1,600-year wine growing history. Anyway, it's got lots of legacy. Hmm. Here you go. In the 18th century, the 1700s, the knight, Le Mot Cadillac, was sent to Louisiana in the United States as governor. And he brought that with was him French his French owned at the time. Right. He brought with him his favorite wine, which would be Cadillac. And he eventually, because the Louisiana territory was huge, founded the city of Detroit. Detroit, I'm sure it was right, called. Detroit. <laughs> and many, many years later, centuries later, Henry Leland and William Murphy paid homage by naming the luxury car for him oh and God. used his coat of arms no as way. the emblem. Wow, that's fascinating. I had no idea. Yep. Cadillac and Cadillac are the same. Huh. Cadillac is this long, thin strip. You can see it on the map, 37 miles or 60 kilometers long at its fattest. It's 3.1 miles or 5 kilometers wide. It is on the right bank of the Gironde River. Now, the Gironde is where... The estuary is, that's where Bly is, and it's where all of the famous communes of the Medoc are. As you move inland, the two rivers that meet at the Gironde are the Dordogne in the north, which we've already discussed. That is going to be for saint emilion and all of those areas on the right bank. And then you have the Gironde, which is going to go back into southwest France. Are you including the map in the notes here? You need to, because yes. looking at the map will be a huge, huge help. If anybody's watching this on YouTube, it will be the show art. This is going to face Grave. Grave is a left bank Appalachian. It is a southern left bank Appalachian, but left bank Appalachian. Nonetheless, Grave, Pesac, Leonon, across the river. Very prestigious. Cadillac is here. This is 5,436 acres or 2,200 hectares, over 39 communes because it is so long. 230 wine growers, one co op. Average estate is 27 acres or 11 hectares. Again, not as big as Bly, but the difference here is only 10% is organic or biodynamic. This is one of the only Bordeaux appellations that requires bottling at the chateau. You may not bottle anywhere else except the chateau because they see that as a sign of authenticity and quality. Does not bode well for small and young producers. Right. Sounds like a barrier to entry. It is a barrier to entry. Right. The terroir, you've got hillside slopes here. Again, Cote, Cote de Bordeaux. They're not lying here. This is going up really, really high here, 50 meters. 
or oh, 164 feet. I'm kidding. This huge. is kind of low lying. It's a little bit of a stretch to call it a In the slope. Clouds. Right. Yep. It's on the edge of a limestone plateau. That commonality of soil type, the climate is going to be tempered by the river. So it'll be a little bit warmer. But Cadillac does better in later ripening vintages where you can get sunshine throughout the fall and the grapes can get ripe. Looks like most of it has southwestern exposure. Right, south and southwest facing slopes, and we'll put that in quotes. Limestone, pebbly gravel on the top of the hill, clay limestone in the middle of the hill, and then gravel and sand at the foot of the slopes, which is what we've been saying pretty much about all of these areas that are right on the river. The grape varieties, different from what we've talked about so far. Mm -hmm. The lowest percentage Merlot that we have talked about so far is 60% in Franc. Here it's 55% Merlot and Cadillac, 25% Cabernet Sauvignon, 15% Cabernet Franc, and 5% Malbec. This has red fruit like cherries and strawberries, but also that black currant is going to come in because you have Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon where that is more common. Oh, that's where the currant comes. Okay. Earthiness. Yep. Tannin, because you have more of these cabs, and Merlot has lower tannin. And then you have softness from the Merlot and the Malbec. Cadillac, simpler, the red fruit, they can be very, very good in great vintages, though. So Cadillac is generally lower priced, but in really warm vintages, pick it up because it can be stunning. So price-wise, does it fit in between Castillon and Bly? Yes. All of these fit between the highest priced wines of Castillon and Franc. Franc can be quite expensive. And Bly is lower priced for sure. But Cadillac can be lower priced as well. Here's the other thing. They do make whites here. And in fact, everybody makes whites, but they're just AOC Bordeaux Blanc. This is a hot topic actually in Bordeaux at large is they took away all the appellations a lot of the appellations for Blanc. So now everything is Bordeaux Blanc and there's not a whole lot of differentiation in quality. The Madoc is grappling with this, especially especially in the O Madoc, where you have these wonderful wines from limestone soils out near the ocean and you can't call them anything except Bordeaux Blanc. Franc is very lucky because they can call their whites Franc, but you cannot do that in Cadillac. But this is what's so confusing. Uh Uh-oh. They make sweet wines, and they're famous. So there are three areas here that are sweet wine production that are not Sauternes. These are different. So this is St. Croix de Mont, Cadillac, and Lupiac. And these are Mm -hmm. sweet wine production. Very confusing. You can have Cadillac, but then there's also another sweet wine appellation where they took the Premier Cote de Bordeaux, which Cadillac used to be called, that used to be Premier Cote de Bordeaux mm-hmm. Rouge. Premier Cote de Bordeaux Rouge went away, and then there was Cadillac Cote de Bordeaux, which indicates red wine only. Then they took Premier Cote de Bordeaux, and they turned it into sweet wines only hmm. after 2014. So now you have Cadillac AOC, which is only for sweet wines. You also have Premier Cote de Bordeaux whites, which are only for sweet wines. And then you have... Cadillac Cote de Bordeaux for the red wines of the region. It's basically the Premier Cote de Bordeaux region covers the same exact territory as Cadillac Cote de Bordeaux, but it's only for sweet wines. I think I And then there's a separate appellation that is in a smaller area for Cadillac AOC. Those are more coveted than the Premier Cote de Bordeaux. Cadillac is a red wine only region, so you don't have Cadillac Cote de Bordeaux Blanc There's none of that. Those whites that they make there are only for Bordeaux Blanc. Hmm. Are there red sweet wines? No, only white sweet wines. But these areas are well known. I mean, Lupiac, Cadillac, and St. Croix de Mont are areas that people in wine do know make sweet wines. But this idea of then changing the Premier Cote de Bordeaux, which again used to be for white and red of Cadillac, and then making it only sweet white, Very confusing. I hope that they look at that again. Let's just say that. Great Chateau in Cadillac, Côte de Bordeaux, Chateau Biac, Chateau Le Mont des Hauts, and Chateau de Marsan for Cadillac. Those are three that that I have had. I can recommend them. The last one, St. Foy Côte de Bordeaux. This is the newest Côte de Bordeaux. It is the smallest Côte de Bordeaux. It is the farthest away Côte de Bordeaux. They really needed this. So it's way out east? Yes, they really needed this association. So this came in 2016. 
How seven did they, years. It seems like a million miles from any of the other regions. This is the so problem. How, this is the big problem for Cote de Bordeaux. And this is the big problem for the producers of St. Foy. How did they become associated with it? Do they have like incredible lobbyists or what? They appealed to Cote de Bordeaux and said, we have similar soils. Huh. We are Merlot dominant. And we need to get in. They really needed this because no one knows them. But the town was founded in 1255. So it's not as if nobody knows about it ever, but right. it just wasn't well marketed. Mm -hmm. The AOC was granted in 1937. At that point, it was only for white wine. It filed to separate from Entre du Mer, which it was part of. So that should give you an idea of why it gets a little bit less respect, because the producers of Entre du Mer in general make Bordeaux and Bordeaux superior. Is it surrounded by Entre du Mer? Yes. Okay. So it is on the hillsides around the town of St. Foy. It's on the far northeastern edge of the Entre du Mer, opposite Cadillac, 40 miles, 65 kilometers east of the city of Bordeaux. It's at the meeting point of the rivers. It's on the edge of the Gironde. It's at the mouth of the Dordogne. And it's near the Latte Garonne, the Garonne River. Very small, 865 acres, 350 hectares. And the average estate is nine hectares or 22 acres, 21 growers, two co-ops, 10% organic. It seems like gerrymandering. <laughs> I mean, look it's at the, look it's at a this. little <laughs> bit of a stretch. Yeah. The soils, though, are clay limestone with gravel on the banks of the river. So that fits the form. Maritime climate with continental influence, once again, fitting that model. There's a little more frost risk here and other places. And this goes sky high up to 120 what? meters in elevation. Oh, my God. Have you had this? Um, I have had one or two bottles. It's hard to get, and I'll explain why in a second. But let me just say first, 97% of production is red, 65% Merlot. 17% Cabernet Sauvignon, 15% Cabernet Franc, and 3% Malbec. The ones that I have had are soft and velvety. They remind me a lot of the wines of Bly. Lots of red fruit, not a lot of black fruit, even though there's Cab in there. They are best enjoyed young. The problem is you can barely get these. Producer is super important here. In order to plant a new vineyard in St. Foy, you actually have to do a soil study to make sure it's okay. They are worried about overplanting because, and they're worried about the reputation. The problem for St. Foy is that you can label just as Cote de Bordeaux for red, or you can do St. Foy Cote de Bordeaux for red, white, semi-sweet, and sweet, Hmm. Or, and this is what a lot of people do, you just bottle as AOC Bordeaux or Bordeaux Superior because you might be able to get more money that way. Because nobody knows what St. Foy is, so they're, they need more effort. Right. The whites are 60% Sauvignon, 30% Sauvignon, 10% Muscadel. And again, you can get a white of St. Foy. Maybe they should, I don't know, if I were them, maybe I'd ride the white if I could. But Chateau Pre La Lande Carbonneau. Chateau Austen Picant. These are our Picant. These are the three that I have seen. I believe the only one that I've had is Pre La Lande. It's a little touch and go for St. Foy. They need to put a little bit more forth. From a marketing in, standpoint. From a marketing okay. standpoint. We have some great momentum since 2009 on the Cote de Bordeaux. They are not sitting around doing nothing. The Castillon and Franc prices have risen. Cadillac is trying. They're not quite there. And Bly is out there, but I think that they're a little bit more focused on the domestic market because only 15% is exported. Oh, wow. okay. But they are exporting their best. And it's tasty. These wines are so delicious. They will give you a lot of pleasure for a fraction of the price of some more prestigious names. Is it going to be like left bank wine? No. Most of this wine does not have a high percentage of Cabernet Sauvignon, and it has different soil types. Is it going to be like saint Emilion? Yes. Are the producers of Franc and Castillon especially trying to hustle and make better wines than what's in saint Emilion with similar soil types? I would argue yes, and they're less money for the quality. So if you're a Bordeaux lover, if you're trying to get into Bordeaux, go get some Bly immediately because those wines are friendly and nice and they're cheap. Okay. Yes. If you are into Bordeaux already, you are welcome. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs>
You're welcome. I'm going to say that right now. And that is an inside joke for everybody that went on the last Piedmont trip. This one's for you, Chris and Veranda and Monica and everybody else on that trip. You're welcome. That is all I'm going to say. I am super excited for you all to try these and to love them. Thank you for the summary of the hidden Bordeaux. You are tasting it right now, and it is pretty awesome. It no? is very awesome, actually. Thank yes. you. Yes. And with that, this has been another episode of Wine for Normal People. Thank you so much for listening, and we will catch you next time.